It does. Lesson nine, the fancy notation. So here's the deal. I've kind of told you about the fancy notation, right? Okay. So um, I don't even know if I'm going to read this top because it's we've got several of these lessons where it's just a whole bunch of review. Okay. Several multiple topics thrown into one. So let's go ahead and talk about absolute value as a distance. Okay. Um, which ironically enough, there's something like this on the Algebra 2 homework today, I just realized, because I was just helping Lorna with it last period. So a real number has two qualities. One of those qualities is whether it is positive or negative, and the other quality is the absolute value of the number. Okay, what do you guys remember about absolute value? Okay, so we always talk about being, by verbal definition, distance from zero, and because it's a distance from zero, absolute value of a number is always a positive value. Okay, so um, notice here, absolute value is not just the bigness of the number. It's a distance the number is away from zero on the number line. Since distance is always positive, then absolute value is always positive. Now, example one here, it asks us to graph the following set on a number line. Thoughts on how we can go about this? Okay, we're going to have to make a number line. <laughs> yes, the circle thingies, the arrows. I'm with you so far. Okay. Well, if you recall from, I don't know, I just taught it today in Algebra 2, but when you have absolute value and a less than sign, what kind of statement does that make it? Less than? Does that ring any bells? Well, maybe not for Maddie. I don't know. I don't know how I taught it in pre-cal, but I know in Algebra 2, it's greater than and less than. So that means because this is a less than sign, it's going to be... An and statement. Okay, it's going to be two. Yeah, and every, because it's absolute value, that tells us we have to set up two. Okay, because it's a less than, it's going to be an and statement, which how does an and statement shade? So it'll be like this way, it'll be a whole, and then it'll go that way, right? It won't be connected. That's your or statement. Okay, so then this one is like there's a little part in the middle Yeah. So an and statement, the shading is in between the numbers because it's and, it's the intersection, it's where the shading overlaps. So it traditionally lands in the middle. An or statement is a union and it's just shade everything, so you're shading, usually it's out from the two numbers is the way it works out. Okay, this should ring some bells is what I'm hoping. Because officially, I can look at this and say that this is going to be all numbers, or all, this is real, right? That's that fancy R. So all real numbers that are less than two units away from five. Okay, I can look at that and know that based on what it's saying. Now, if you think about all numbers less than two units from five, can you visualize what that graph is? So... Num all real numbers less than two units from five. Five, six, seven, eight. Two, three, four. So I just did two through eight on my number line. Where are all numbers that are less than two units from five? Okay. Or in other words, it's going to be the numbers... Between three and seven? Right. So three and seven are the endpoints of my shaded area. And I'm going to do this a different way here in a moment if you don't like what I'm doing. Okay. You're kind of freaking out saying, whoa, this is different. It is. This is one way to think about it. Is it's all numbers less than two units from five. Well, here's five. Less than two units goes out to 
3 and 7, yes? In this case, it's not equal to, so I'm going to put open circles. Now, if you're like, um, Mrs. Sergeant, I didn't like what you just did. Okay, can we go back old school and solve it? Certainly can. Remember the first inequality is stays as is. X minus 5, less than 2. Less than told me I needed the word and. And do you remember what you changed on the second inequality? It's the two. I wasn't sure the way Ross was saying it. I was like, which number is he referring to? It's always whatever's in the absolute value stays as is. So x minus 5 is in the absolute value. It stays as is. The positive 2 becomes negative 2. And because it's an inequality, less than becomes greater than. You have to switch two things. You have to change the inequality sign, and you have to change positive to negative. Now, if we solve this, add 5 x is less than 7, and add 5, x is greater than 3, which is what we just graphed, isn't it? We did x less than 7, so left of 7, and x greater than 3. If you write this in compound inequality notation, x in the middle, bigger number on the right, smaller number on the left, it's x less than 7. So I have a less than sign. It's x greater than 3. So reverse it, and that's 3 less than x. That's what I just graphed, isn't it? Okay. So the point is, yes, you are more than welcome to solve that. That is perfectly fine. But you can also just look at this, and if you can get in that habit of thinking, okay, this is all numbers less than 2 units from 5. I don't think it required you to put the words there, but I think that's good practice. You see where the less than 2 came from? The from 5, because it's in the format x minus a number, so it's x minus 5. If that had said x plus 5, then we'd use negative 5. Are we okay with what I did there? And again, worst comes to worst, you go back old school and solve it, right? I just taught that in Algebra 2 today. So if any of your Algebra 2 friends come looking for help, there's your review because I didn't teach them this way. However, they do have one in homework that I'm going to talk about like that tomorrow. So, Okay, example uh, two if you're ready. Graph the following set on a number line. So same directions is to just graph. Although I'll put it in words too. This time it's still x is a member of the reals such that absolute value of 3x minus 1 is greater than 2. Okay. What's different here? Okay, it's a great or than sign, which means great or than. We're going to set up an or statement. If you're working out that way, what's the graph going to do then? going to go out. Okay. What else is different about this one? There's a coefficient on the x, isn't there? It's a 3x. That makes it slightly different because we're not going to say all numbers greater than two units from one. That's not what we're saying here because there is a three. Probably the best bet for me to say would be think, okay, divide by 3 here. Okay, because there's that coefficient of 3 on the x, basically you're going to divide the 1 by 3. You're also going to have to divide the 2 by 3. So instead of saying all numbers greater than 2 units from 1, we're going to say what? All numbers 
And I said greater than. I have written down more than. Does it matter? You know, something indicating that, you know, all numbers greater than or more than. How many units away? We'd normally say greater than two units away, but there's a coefficient of three on the x, so we're going to say more than two-thirds units from, what's our central number going to be? One-third. Now, if we talk about this graph, okay, I'm going to put some whole numbers on here, and then we'll negative 1, 0, 1, 2. I just put some whole numbers to get us started. Technically, if we're talking about thirds, I should probably take each of those places in between the whole numbers and break them up into thirds. So... Basically, you just need to put your one-third and two-third marks in between each of them, don't you? Okay. All numbers more than two-thirds unit from one-third. So where is one-third? Okay, a little past zero. That's kind of our centering point. What do I need to know? We need to go two-thirds in either direction. Where are we two-thirds? Because it's all numbers more than two-thirds units from one-third. Where is two-thirds? One and negative one third. And then so it's more than two thirds units from one third, which means you're shading where from those spots? You're shading away because we want to be more than two thirds from those spots. Now, did anyone solve it out by hand to check it that way? Does it work out? Okay. And I purposely chose to teach it this way first because I needed to pay maybe a little bit more attention to me if I taught it this way first than if I just went ahead and solved it and then taught it this way afterwards. So if you set it up by hand, it's 3x minus 1 greater than 2 or 3x minus 1 less than negative 2. Add 1, 3x greater than 3, x greater than 1, or add 1, 3x less than negative 1, x less than negative 1 third. And that's what I graphed. Okay, so there's no nothing wrong with going old school and solving it that way. But what I would ask is that you try and look for the connection to what I showed. Okay, so maybe try this first and then check it your, that way. Just look for the connections, because it is an important connection to notice. Okay, questions there? Okay, shall we graph some special functions? And, you know, what I'm going to say is, let's, I'm not going to grab the calculator to graph these guys. It's trying to, okay... What do we know about how to graph these without grabbing the calculator? Okay, not saying you couldn't grab the calculator, but, you know, these are some things we should know. So, first example says graph y equals absolute value of negative sine x. Hmm, and do we remember how to graph sine? <laughs> Maddie's over here waving, it looks like, right? <laughs> I know what you mean. They know what you mean. Okay, so I'm actually going to do two graphs, kind of a getting started graph, and then I'll do a final graph. 
But if you recall, I always do my sine graphs like this, right? Um, what's the period of sine? 2 pi. So if we're just doing a traditional 2 pi, I'm going to label 2 pi. So I label the middle as pi. I'm at least going to put tick marks at my quarters. What's the range of sine? How high and low does it go? Yeah. Has an amplitude of 1, if you will. So it goes from negative 1 to 1. Now, if we just graph sine, what's it do? Starts 0. Goes up. Then it crosses through at pi. Notice I'm just doing this in pencil, right? Has a minimum. Crosses through at 2 pi, yes? That's traditional sine. Okay, baby steps. What is negative sine x? Reflected, yes? So that's what I'm going to draw here. Reflected, so basically... Go down. Yeah, you flip them, right? Instead of going up, we're going to go down. We're still going to cross through the same area, and then instead of going down, we go up. So what I just drew there in orange... That is plain old negative sine x. Okay. So how does absolute value change that? Okay, yeah. I wasn't sure which way you were saying that. But, yeah, so instead of you never go below. Because absolute value takes anything that's negative and makes it positive. So if it's y equals the absolute value of this, any y values that were going to be negative are now going to be positive. So now all my hills are on top, right? There's no valleys. Well, no valleys down below. I think you guys know what I mean. So I was going to say, I guess there's still valleys of the zeros aren't there. But none of our traditional, traditionally it's mountain valley, mountain valley. It's not that same. So yes, this graph will officially be, so instead of, you know, on negative sine x, we went down. Well, because it's absolute value, we're going to go up. And then we're going to go up again. So it would just keep going on and on like that, right? And this is the final graph, absolute value of negative sine x. Okay with that one way or another. And obviously, could you graph it on your calculator and get it to work out? You could, but there's something to be said for understanding, okay, what's that negative do? It reflects it. What's the absolute value do? It makes it positive. I mean, that was a big thing in Algebra 2. So, okay. Example 4. We've got three graphs we're going to squeeze in here. And they are going to get each get their own graph, which means I'm just scooting over to the left here. Graph A. Square root of X. Do you remember what it looks like? Maybe. I think he knows what he's talking about. Do you guys have confidence there? Like half a parabola turned on its side. Okay. The verbal description, the non-mathematical description, is half a parabola on its side. I mean, we kind of know what we mean there, right? And if you think about points, it would go through 0, 0, 1, 1, and 4, 2 if you want some points. I'm not saying you'd have to have points, but I don't feel like mine's very good there, but it is. It is essentially half a parabola on its side because... Um, this is the inverse. Okay, so that's A. Bless you. Which, well, keep in mind, square root of X, how do you write that with um, exponents? 
That's x to what power? x to the one half, right? The mm -hmm. yep. And just keep in mind that everything always has to be positive in a square root, doesn't it? So if you're doing the square root of something, it's going to have to be a positive result. Okay, B. Do you remember B? Well, this is x to what power? One third. Okay, so cube root of x, x to one power. Okay, if you don't remember, so this was half of a sideways parabola, right? So this was half of x squared turned on its side. So if you know x squared, we just know we need the positive half because it's a square root. Cube root of x relates to what'd you say, Ethan? And we're talking the cube root of x, x to the one third. Which graph are we going to take and switch sideways? x to the third. Yeah, okay. It's the one, it just increases, it kind of jogs at zero, zero, and goes up, right? Okay, so we're going to take x cubed, and we're going to turn it sideways, basically. Now, the difference is, are we allowed negatives here? Yes. Yes, so we don't have to do half of it. We can do the whole thing. Yeah. So... Which means I'm going to draw my graph differently because I do need all four quadrants. Um, normally on x cubed, we think what? 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 8. Reverse those numbers if you're looking for ordered pairs. So I counted out 8 left and right, knowing what I was doing here. And so if we think about this, they'll still do that dot at 0, 0. You'll have 1, 1. And then if you put in 8, the cube root of 8 is 2. So you have 8, 2 over in negatives. Negative 1, negative 1, because the cube root of negative 1 is negative 1. And negative 8, negative 2. And so... Looks something like that. And again, I'm trying to show you the connections, right? So it's not necessarily about memorizing, okay, this is what the cube root of x looks like. It's about, okay, related to x cubed. It's the inverse, so. Okay, C. What about C? Okay. Yeah, I, I didn't even catch that mistake. I knew what you meant. So x to the two-thirds. What if I say it is x to the one-third squared? Does that make sense? Okay, so now it's taking the Right. So it's just that. Well... X could still be negative, but Y won't ever be negative now. Okay, so I wasn't sure which way. Yeah, so Jacob said X to two-thirds. X to one-third raised to the power of two. What I'm trying to get you is, okay, the cube root of X graph, but then square it. And if you think about it, squaring something is kind of like taking the absolute value of something. Because absolute value, you can't get a negative response. What happens when you square something? You can't get a negative response. So basically, and I'm not going to worry about ordered pairs here. I'm just going to sketch. But the right side of the graph we just had stays as it is. The left half of the graph is going to flip up. And so when we take this graph here and we square it, we're going to end up with this graph here. And I'm just going to... Does that work for you guys? And it makes sense in my brain because you said it's like taking the absolute value of something and it's similar to the absolute value of something. Yeah. It's 
not identical, but it's similar, right? Yeah. And if you think it through, yes, you could take put an x, a negative x value, because you can take the cube root of a negative x. But then when you square that negative, it becomes positive, which is kind of the difference with the square root or the yeah the square root. We didn't have anything negative in the x's because you can't even take the square root of a negative. Okay. Are my connections making somewhat sense? No guarantees you'll remember them, right? But, okay, example five. Do you remember anything about this? Is this the one that's Yep. Okay. Um, what is written right here is y equals, and it looks like a bracket, right? But if you just type in a bracket on your calculator, your calculator is not going to acknowledge that. On your calculator, you have to find int x, which I think is in the math menu somewhere. But it's the greatest integer function, and it can also be written as int, int, x. So I said that's what you have to find on the calculator to graph it, and it's somewhere in there. It's in the math menu. It might be in one of your um, F1, you know, like the F menus. It might be in one of those. It does stair step. The key is just knowing exactly how these stair steps work. So let's see. I'm going to number out to three on each of my axes. And there is some stuff you can figure out by actually graphing it and doing some tracing. You can kind of figure out some of the pieces as to where things go. Okay, so I try and remember that the basic one starts on the x-axis from 0 to 1. Now in all of these, one end has a closed circle, the other end has an open circle, and that's where trace could help you. But the left end is always the closed end. The right end is always the open circle. So now that's from 0 to 1. You take a break and you jump up to 1, 1. From there, at the height of 1, we draw over and we have a line that goes over to 2, 1, open circle. At 2, you jump up to 2, 2, closed circle, leading over to... And you can reverse it down below, yes? Or not reverse it, but continue the pattern. So from negative 1, negative 1 over, and then open circle. Negative 2, 2, over, open circle. Negative 3, 3, over, open circle. We learned that last year. You can graph it. Always good to know the basic, you know, okay, it's a stair step one, as Ross said. Um, know which side is open, which side is closed. What else do I need to say? They all have a length of one. Oh, I don't know what I was going to say. And why is this a function? It passes the vertical line test because yeah. even though those endpoints overlap. This would be the open circle. Yeah. So it overlaps where there's an open and a closed circle. And so that makes it pass the vertical line test and it is a function. Yes. I don't think there would be. I don't know. I've never gone to that extent, so I'm going to go with you wouldn't see that at this level. I don't know if there could be a number with the X or not. That would be a question for Google at this point in my life. Cause... Well, technically, so technically, when it comes to AP Calc, there's two AP Calc classes. This is AB, and there's BC. So officially, it's broken into parts A, B, and C. AB kind of covers first and second parts, 
and then BC covers recovers second and covers third. Because some people jump right in and do A B A B and B C all in one year. We don't teach B C here. Okay. Um, when you get to college, I took Calc one, Calc two, and Calc three. So, granted, I was a math major, so that makes a difference there. So, I think Calc one maybe goes with A B, maybe. I don't remember for sure, but okay. Gotta get moving. I'm gonna run out of time. Piecewise functions. Write an equation for the function whose graph is shown. And this is what we call a piecewise function because can we just write one nice neat equation for it? No, there's not one nice neat equation. So we're going to break this into chunks, so to speak. Okay? And we're going to write it as a piecewise function. So when you see a piecewise function, it's all they're all going to be y equals, but this is where you kind of do the brace and it's y equals this when x is this. Y equals this when x is this. Y equals this when x, you know, so we have to account for every piece of this graph. So how do I want to start this? Should we start right here on the left? Okay, so the first thing I see is if I break it right there at that term. Because we don't have a way we can write an equation with that sharp turn in there. But if I break it right there, what equation is this? It's what? Don't go that fancy. Go basic algebra one type equations. Okay. A horizontal line that passes through negative one, can we agree? Okay, so this part of the piecewise function, I've already got y equals, and it's going to be y equals negative 1. Now, for what x values are we talking about right there? So this piece is y equals negative 1, and it goes from x equals 0 to 1. So I'm going to write as an inequality as in 0 less than x, less than 1. Except I left something off, but I was kind of waiting to see. And why would it be or equal to 1? It does equal negative 1 there, doesn't it? But at 0, there is a whole... So we could write this as 0 less than x less than or equal to 1. Okay. So that's the first section. Now if we continue going left to right, the second section is going to be this diagonal line. What's our favorite equation of a line? Y equals mx plus b, yes? Now, even though we're not talking about it, doesn't this line technically extend? Okay, where, you know, piecewise, we're only looking at that little section. But to get the equation, what kind of slope is there? What kind of y-intercept is there? Slope is 1. We're rising 1, running 1. I would say follow your slope, and that will give you your y-intercept. That's the easiest way to do it in my brain. Because if I continue then going down 1 over 1, I'm going to be at negative 2. So this piece in the middle is y equals 1x minus 2, if you will, or x minus 2. And so I'm kind of writing it on the graph so you can see what I'm talking about. So... Next piece, y equals x minus 2. For what x values is that valid? Basically from where my orange dotted lines are, right? From 1 to 3. So I'm going to say 1 less than x less than 3. Okay. Um, yes. And, yeah, the 1 can have an equals under it. Officially, we already had equals under the 1 up here. 
And so you don't necessarily have to have a equals under the one there, but you can. Okay. Well, my computer, we have one more piece. What is it? Okay, it's a horizontal line. If you extended that horizontal line, sorry, horizontal, it would go through positive one, wouldn't it? And so this piece is y equals one. So y equals one for what values of x? Okay, and so since I've been using inequalities today, I'm going to say x greater than three. And again, this is one that's flexible. You can say greater than three, or you could say greater than or equal to three. Because we've already defined it for three up here, but it could work either way. Does that make sense? Okay. That is a piecewise function. I don't know that you've ever written one before. You've seen them sometimes, but at least I think you've seen them. Maybe not a whole lot, but. I've seen them. Okay, it's possible. Okay, I've got to bust a move here. We've got to do some logs. Okay. Logs. Common logs use base 10, and we call them common logs. Oh, wait, I skipped. Sorry, I skipped a section, didn't I? I was reading down here at 9D. Sorry, form of a logarithm. Log base B of N equals L can be rewritten using, you remember the phrase, left, right, middle. And the left, right, middle is the base of B here, raised to the power of L, equals the middle of N. So B to the L equals N. So right here, on this basic example, write 4 equals 5 to the Y as a logarithm. So basically, undo it and go the other way. If you want, I don't know, is it easier for you guys if it says 5 to the y equals 4 instead of 4 equals 5 to the y? Log of what? Or log base what, I should say. Mm -hmm. Hope you got it. One of my shortcuts is 5 is the base of the exponent. 5 is also the base of the log. That's one of the things I remember. And then from there, the y and 4 just kind of switch. I don't know. You find your way to remember it, right? You've been doing this since Algebra 2. You've got your technique. You just need it refreshed. Okay, now what I started to read. Okay, logs that use 10. As a base, are called common logs. You use the LOG button on the calculator. So like something like log 4.2 really means log base 10 of 4.2. Logs that use E as a base are called natural logs, and that's the LN button on a calculator. So like LN of 3.2 is really LN base E, or excuse me, log base E of 3.2. Can you guys tell that's an E? That's a base E. Okay, so example 9.8, write 2.4 as a power of the base 10 and E. And I don't have a ton of time here to lead and guide, but they want 2.4 as a power of base 10. So basically I want to know 10 to some power equals 2.4. That's what they're asking me to find, is what power of 10 is it? Thoughts on how I can do this? And how'd you do that? Okay, basically reverse that left, right, middle, or however you want to think about it. So it's log, officially it's base 10 of 2.4 equals L, right? I wrote the base 10 in there, but if you don't write the base 10 in there, you're fine. How do you find the value of L then? You grab the calculator, you type it in. 
I have 0 0.38 written down. No idea what the calculator says, but. Okay, so if we write 2.4 as a power of base 10, that's saying that 2.4 is approximately 10 to what power? At 10 to the 0 0.38. That's what they're asking you to do there. What's different on part B? It's, yep. So E instead of 10. So E to some power equals 2.4. If you undo that, instead of it being log of 2.4, it's going to be natural log of 2.4. I guess if you really wanted to say log base E of 2.4, but that just seems weird to me. And so, again, you would punch that in the calculator. Natural log of 2.4. I've written down approximately 0.88. And so, for this case, 2.4 is approximately e to the power of 0 0.88. I went through that quickly, but are you guys okay with that if you look at it? Okay. What are listed as simple log problems? Example 9 when you're ready. Log base one-third of P equals 2. Solve for P. What can I do? Yeah, I would. Left, right, middle. If we think left, right, middle, how do we rewrite this? Yeah. One third to the second equals P, which is a lot easier than the alternative, right? Because that one I could do. Okay. So left, right, middle, one-third to the second equals P. And so what does that mean P is? 1 over 9. Oh, I said, wow, that was easy. Okay, what about example 10? Okay, left, right, middle, X to the second equals 6X minus 9. How are we going to solve an equation like that? Maybe. What do I have to do right now? Make it equal zero. So x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals zero. And you're oh so missing your factoring days. So what does this factor into? No? The x minus 3 and x minus 3, because it's x and x, multiplies to be 9, adds to be negative 6. So it's 3 and 3, multiply to be positive, adding to be negative, they're both negatives. And so what does x equal here? x is 3. Okay. Don't we, though? Although I made you factor. A couple of years ago, you guys would have complained about that. Okay, example 11. Log base B of 9 equals negative 1 half. So how am I going to rewrite this? It is. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I'm not going to go that route, but let's talk. What does b to the negative one-half mean? The negative would take it to the denominator. The one-half means it's a square root. So one way to think about this, which is valid, is 1 over the square root of b equals 9. So you'd have to get that b out of the denominator. You'd have to square it to get rid of the square root. It's doable. Now, I'm going to take one quick step from here, though. If I take b to the negative one-half and I raise it to a power, Ultimately, we want to know 
b to the first, right? In order to find b, we want to know b to the first. What power can I take this negative one half and raise it to that makes it b to the first? Not zero, because I want it to be b to the first, not just one in general. b to the first. Almost negative square. Or in other words, raising it to the power of negative two. Negative square sounds weird. But because what is negative one half times negative two? Positive one, right? So then we end up with b, nine to the negative two. Okay, well, the negative tells me to take it to the denominator. So then I have 1 over 9 squared, which is 1 over 81. That wasn't horrible. I don't think. Yeah, it wasn't horrible. This is calculus. That wasn't horrible. Okay. Now, could you have instead saying 1 over the square root of b and worked that way? You could have. You would have gotten the same thing eventually. It wouldn't have even taken that long, really. Um, example 12. 3 to the 2m plus 1 is equal to 1 over 27. Okay. In Algebra 2, I gave you a paper that helped you. Because it had all these powers written on it. And so Patty's like, okay, I wasn't here for algebra two. How can I make three and twenty-seven the same base? Okay. So three to the two m plus one, as weird as it says, that's actually good. Twenty-seven is three to the third. So what's one over twenty-seven? Three to the negative third. And so we did these equations back in Algebra 2. We probably reviewed them in pre-cal, honestly. When the bases are the same, you can drop the bases off and set the exponents equal to each other. And this is not an ugly problem at all. 2m plus 1 equals negative 3. 2m equals negative 4. m is negative 2, barring I made no math mistakes. Okay, real quick. Technically, there's one other page. There's not really works to do works work to do on it, but I want to talk about it real quick. Okay, so there's just some information. Um, in later lessons, we discussed the fact that a curve does not have a defined slope at a point where the curve makes a sudden change in direction. Graphs of many absolute value functions come to one or more points called there's a good word in there cusp. Okay, so when there's a point, a hard point, as opposed to a soft curve. Most of the time when we graph stuff, we just have soft curves, right? But when it comes to a hard, sharp point, that's a cusp. Um, these, this has a lot to do with derivatives, integrals when we get there. But um, just look at some of these with me. I'm not going to read the rest. I wanted to, for instance, okay, y equals x plus 2. You know how to graph y equals x plus 2, yes? Okay, what about if I put absolute value bars on it? Absolute value says anything that is negative becomes positive. What if I put a negative in front of the absolute value? It's going to reflect it, basically, right? And it's making the results of that absolute value be negative. Okay, there's an example with sign here. Here's a basic sine curve. We've already talked about absolute value of sine is all positive, right? What if you say negative absolute value of sine? Then they become all negatives. Okay. Um, you've got a parabola here. X squared minus 2 takes the parabola down 2. What's the absolute value do? That <laughs> makes a W. Any part that is negative has to flip up, like above, right? What's the negative absolute value do? Takes the whole thing and reflects it. 
Um, here we have a negative parabola, which means the parabola is already upside down. Absolute value makes it all flip. Anything that's down below flip up, and then the negative absolute value reflects it. Okay, so that's just some various graphs. We kind of already did that at the beginning of the notes, didn't we? But that's just showing some various graphs. So, homework, problem set nine. Okay. Wouldn't it be cool to do like a problem where you just spell your name and special graphs?